Vernomatic Productions. Are you ready? Live from the Metal Mayhem Studios in Rochester, New York. We are gold. We are gold. And heard around the world by metalheads just like you. This is Metal Mayhem ROC. Heavy metal music. Your weekly dose of metal music. Interviews, album reviews, news, and more. Want to be part of the show? Send us a message through our website, MetalMayhemROC.com. Or hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Search Metal Mayhem ROC. A proud member of the Pantheon podcast team. It's getting nice and heavy. Now, welcome our hosts, John the Vernomatic Verno, and direct from New Jersey, Metal Walt. Well, today we got a day off. We got a friend. He goes by the name of Adam Dubin. He's been doing uh, rock and roll videos, documentaries for well over 35 years. Adam, welcome to Metal Mayhem ROC. How are you? Happy to be here. Metal ups to you. I'd like to introduce you to our uh, <laughs> my co-host, Metal Wall from New Jersey. And right off the bat, he's going down heavy metal memory lane. Walt, say hello to Adam. Adam, what's up, brother? I'm a Jersey guy right over the river. I'm on similar grounds for many, many years, I'm sure. Uh, nice we, to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. I'm sure we had banged at the same show at some point. So uh, absolutely. So John and I were um, we were talking earlier and he said, you know, he says, you're going to love this guy, Adam, man. He's like you. He's a New York guy, Jersey guy. He loves to talk. He's passionate about it. And I started thinking about my experiences growing up as a kid or a teenager. And I think you and I are about the same age range. I'm 53. And mm -hmm. um, I said, you know, uh, it, it's no secret that you uh, you studied at NYU. But right. I wanted to take a little walk down New York City Village heavy metal memory lane and remind you of some of the great places that we probably walked. Right. Okay. So for me, I took a train, the path train, the Harrison path train. And mm -hmm. I got over to uh, 33rd Street, came up to the top of 8th Street Station yep. and uh, and uh, actually the 9th Street Station, stopped at Bella's Pizza, got a big sloppy pizza sandwich and uh, turned around to 9th Street. And then the first thing you did on 9th Street was go record shopping, right? Yeah. Place, right? Yeah, of course. I, uh, you know, I mean, all these record shops, this one, uh, it's only rock and roll and Bleaker Bob's, Rat Cage Records, Sounds. Um, you know, you would just kind of make the make these rounds of all these record uh, company uh, record stores rather. And um, you know, the, the I, it, I mean, it's not to name drop, but you know who my roommate was at college. You know, so it was like when I met Rick Rubin. I, 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 I mean, we, you know, I used to look through these stores before, but now like it was like we kind of had a purpose and I would go through and I was learning about all these new bands and everything. But Rick was actually he was that next step evolved in terms of he was making records. Even by the time I met him, I was 18. He was 19 and he was making, you know, pressing vinyl, making records for his band Hose. And he would go around the, you know, kind of the East Village going, hey, uh, I've got to check my inventory and we would go around store to store nine nine records that's another one ed bauman's nine nine records and and we would just go place to place and and uh yeah there you are i mean any, any second coming records sure and you know he would go in and like literally you know physically count the number of units in there and then go up to the front and like ask for payment if if he had dropped off 10 and there was only five there now he would say Okay, someone bought five of my records. That was the arrangement. Um, very simple, you know, but it was like he wasn't the only guy doing it. There was, there was, um, that's how, uh, you know, do it yourself punk was, was done. And, and, and again, Rick, Rick being so, uh, progressive as he was, I think he saw the same thing in, in hip hop before a lot of other people saw it, you know, for what it was, which was essentially do it yourself music but african-american version of that you know coming out of the bronx but certainly other places and people just pressing up vinyl and making uh making their own you know records and selling them because basically um you know labels that supported um uh r&b were not supporting rap in those very early days so again it was sort of 
he just recognized this for for being the the punk rock way that it that it was you know guys let me Adam, ask i you. had a question um Let's... go um these these stars looked very small all right are there, well there's just the angle of the uh pictures or were, were they that small well i you know i've i've been to um you know, independent uh, vinyl stores in like other parts of the country. And of course you got more room, but, you know, always remember, you know, New York city, uh, you know, that space is at a premium. So, I mean, bleaker Bob's there. It's at, it's in the, uh, it's, it's in the bottom of a tenement building. Um, so is these other ones. So it's, you know, yeah, the aisles are kind of tight. Um, everything's stacked up and dusty, but it's um, that's how it was in New York, but certainly, Certainly, yeah, I've been to vinyl shops, you know, in New Jersey, where Wall and many other parts of the country, they're not quite as packed uh, tight like that. There's a little more room for some other stuff going on, too. Yeah, I think this is uh, Bleaker Bob's. I always remember because it was the pilgrimages. Again, you went down A Street, you went to yeah. it's only rock and roll. And John, for your knowledge, it's only rock and roll was up on the second floor. So you had to go up these stairs yeah. and uh this was like the starting place where I caught my infatuation for live bootleg cassettes that yeah. uh, it was the place to go where you would see a show, let's say at the Ritz or wherever later. And you go down there and for 10 bucks, you get half of that show. But yeah. that was always what they did. They fucked with you. They would give half the show and then make you come back another later. And by the end. And the funny part was for <laughs> some reason, they always cut songs out and it just pissed me off. But uh, <laughs> this place was classic. You had Revolver Records right down the street. And then as mm -hmm. you went around Washington Square Park, you went over to Bleecker Bob's. And Adam, I know you know this, but I think Bleecker's was, to me, I was looking for the metal. But I think Bleecker Bob's had more of that rock punk Ramones kind of feel to it, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was going to Bleecker Bob's when I was going into the, the city. When I started going into the city as a as a like middle teenager, when I could take the train on my own, um, I was going there and it was the late seventies. And, and so you could kind of, um, get, you know, it, it was really, it was very punk back then. I mean, they were selling records, you know, that you could find nowhere, Wayne County and the electric chairs, um, just really, you know, like low side punk stuff that I thought was cool. Ramones, of course, being descriptive of all of that, but, mm -hmm. um, really singles by all, all those guys. And there wasn't a lot of record shops in a lot of other parts of town or, or, you know, certainly other on Long Island that you were going to ever find something like that, you know? Yeah. I, I have a question, Adam, just like, I was always curious what came first. Were you into filmmaking and then you kind of got your love for metal or did the metal come first and then the filmmaking or were they both mutually exclusive? Um, I, you know, I fell in love with with um, filmmaking at about 11 years old or something. I picked up a, a movie camera uh, that was in the house and, and I started filming stuff with it. You know, had no idea prior to that that, that you could do something like that. Once I did, I, did, I started making films, Super 8 and everything. But what started to happen is I became like, like as soon as I became like a teenager, I mean, I, mean, I liked music, but then rock music hit me and it, it, it hit me you know, one, because I could listen to like FM rock radio and, but really in a major way was seeing some kid that young, but what there was, was I went down to the movie theater and in re-release was the Woodstock movie. And like, I mean, I saw that, that was, you know, I, at the time I just thought it was great, but in hindsight, I, over these years, I've realized that that was a bit of a turning point for me seeing, seeing Woodstock, seeing those performances, which, you know, I mean, again, I, I, I've always said this, that the reason I think, I mean, Woodstock was an important festival, but the reason it's important and it's remembered is, is because somebody was there with a movie camera. And because of that, we now have it forever. There was other bigger festivals, but nobody was there documenting it. In this case, they were. So it was that combining of film and music that really hit me and made a difference. Now, going along, going along, I wasn't going around filming bands yet, but I was making films because I thought at that time I'd be a narrative filmmaker and I'm doing like whatever short film stories I'm doing. 
But when I got to NYU, um, MTV was maybe a year old at that point. So it was not like this. It was coming up, but it was not yet the dominant force that it became. That took another year or so because everybody didn't have it yet. It was not everywhere. And so, but what was MTV if not the combining of film and music in, in this way? And suddenly bands that, that may not ever have broke out, suddenly they broke out because of MTV. And so suddenly the whole landscape changed. And I was right there for that. And so um, suddenly I started thinking about my filmmaking in a whole nother way. Like, oh, I can do this. You know, this is something that like, I can make film and video. So, I mean, I loved it. I, I I dove right into that stuff. And and metal kind of, I always went for heavier music. Um, and I loved metal. Um, it, it wasn't metal. I mean, it's hard rock. I mean, what I was listening to, because it was a little slightly before exactly metal. Um, but, I, you know, I loved Led Zeppelin and uh, and all that kind of stuff. But what happened was, is metal was rising also hip hop was rising and I was in New York. So I was, I was much more, I would say at that moment in time into hip hop stuff, or I was in that world a little bit more. Um, and I, you know, checking out metal and stuff, but, but hip hop was just, just right there in my face because of where I was, you know, in New York city. Well, all three of those, like the punk metal hip hop, they're very close to each other in the uh, philosophy and the integrity behind it. Yeah. But now when you talk I, about MTV, so. when MTV was coming around 80, 81, the interesting thing with that was the conceptual videos really blew up once the medium uh, got expanded. But some of those late yeah. 70s, you had the concert videos, but then you had some of those really early uh, conceptual videos like Judas Priest had some and, you know, Rush had some in like, like 77, 78. Um, yeah. did you, were you able to see any of that stuff? Because back then there was pre MTV, you had Don Kirshner's rock concert. You had, um, you know, some of those other shows on after Saturday night live on Saturday nights, but what was your first exposure on conceptual pieces being a filmmaker? Um, you, you know, you saw, I mean, I definitely sought that stuff out. I love Don Kirshner's rock, rock concert. I love the midnight special mm -hmm. show and because you could see bands on it and um you know that was my first time of seeing a lot of bands and a lot of times the bands of course wouldn't actually be on the show they would send uh a, the, the at the time they were just called promotional clips but um so i i mean i got my first look at a lot of things but the thing i sought out like a lot of people of our generation was kiss because when kiss happened um, I was right there. I was exactly the right age when Kiss Alive came out. Uh -huh. And and that grabbed me like nothing else. Uh, you know, same story as a lot of people. Just looking at, it was looking at that front cover, which was like nothing you ever saw before. Kids in Kobo Arena and um, or Kobo Hall, wherever it was, and those yep. kids at the poster. And feeling like, it's exactly it generated exactly the feeling that they wanted was you're something's going on and you want to get in on it. You're missing it, but you want to get in on this. And those kids with the self-made kiss poster, that's the first time I ever saw that. And I was just like, this is amazing. And I mean, you know, to my, my father's, you know, uh, forever credit, I wanted to see kiss and, and at 12 years old, he took me to go see rock and roll over tour. Nice. So, I was Jeez. just like, yeah, I know. I was like, yeah. that was my first thing. It'd be a long time until I could see any of the concerts because my father was done. He was one and out. and uh, But that was quite something to see. Yeah, I, I mean, I was all in. So it was like what I sought out, as you guys probably know, was you start looking to see, can you see Kiss anywhere? Can you see some videos? And so sometimes they would be on one of those late night shows Sometimes something, you know, the Paul Lynn special yeah. that, that that was one of the first appearances. Yeah. The we all were waiting. We were hoping that Phantom of the Park was going to be amazing, but <laughs> you know, we were kind of like, I don't think that's amazing. But you know, a lot of times those promotional clips of Kiss were, you know, you'd see them on some of these shows. So yeah, that was that was important to me 
prior to like MTV ever, ever becoming a thing. And I would say too, on that point, Adam, uh, the village voice, like, like for me, that was a big way to find out about concerts, right? You would, we couldn't get it in Jersey. So you'd have to, again, do your pilgrimage to New York city, grab that free paper. There's an example of an old one in the red box. And you'd have to look up and see who were coming to all your favorite arenas and clubs. But um, going back to the the topic on uh, Woodstock, a um, couple things here. I was always infatuated, and I'm sure you will. And I'm curious about your experiences here. You know, you did the rock, the record shops, but right across the street was the elusive Electric Lady Studios. That it's what? still to me this day is like it, it. You know, look at it. It's brick. It's got this weird front. Yeah. You can't really see it, but you know, like, like these legendary people, Hendrix, Kiss. How many others were there? Yeah. Did you ever step foot? there for any, yeah, any professional um, reasons? I, didn't, I, I mean, we, I walked by it all the time. There was a a, a store next to it, I believe, uh, called Flip that had like kind of cool rock and roll ish clothing and everything. But that 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 kind of stuff was all up and down that 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 block in that area. And you know, you'd walk by it, and, and you know, being in the village, we all knew that's that was Hendrix's place and everything. But of course, that history had taken place over a decade before. And, but I finally got to go in there in, uh, it would be in a, probably in 1986. And when Rick Rubin was making the electric album with, um, for the cult and that was being recorded there. And that was when, um, you know, those guys, uh, Ian, Ian and, uh, Billy Duffy came over from England and they were working on it. And, um, there's actually a bit of a backstory um Ruben was we were going around scouting locations for what would be the run DMC movie tougher than leather and while we're scouting locations Ruben's constantly got like a a, I was driving him around and we'd go to one place look at that location go to another and in between my car had a um a cassette player so he was constantly shuffling cassettes through it so I'm hearing like mixes of what would be License to Ill, the songs on License to Ill as he's working on them from Chung King. But the other thing that came in, he goes, he goes, check this out. He goes, do you know this band, The Cult? And I, I did know them. I knew she sells Sanctuary and I liked them. They were, they were like, cool. But I mean, I didn't. He, goes, he plays me a song from, I forget which one. And it sort of sounds like the way the 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 sound is on on she sells sanctuary it was like that kind of brit pop kind of thing going on a lot of shimmery sounds and everything and he goes they want me to do something with them and i'm like oh that'd be cool you know then we're just talking about it a little bit well sometime later we're in, still in pre-production for for the mo- movie and um and now billy duffy's hanging out and and around and Rick is like talking to him and, you know, there's like a lot of conversations and stuff. Billy's young, you know, he was young, young then. And, uh, and uh, he definitely had a couple drinks too at the time. And, um, and, and then it was like, they're in the studio and there's Ian and there's, there's Billy, there's the rest of the guys and everything. And it was, and Ruben is, I hear what he's doing and he's essentially turning it into, he's taking away all the shimmery stuff, all that jingle jangle stuff. And it's, ACDC and it's basically the electric record that we know it to be now and it's cool and you know it was so I would I would have things to do I was working for Rick and I would I would go down to um, uh, Electric Ladyland Studios pretty often in and out of there just so I could update him on something get something get some information bring him something whatever so yeah I heard that thing as they were working on it that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Is it as glamorous as this as it seems, or is it, you know, a, a stall that doesn't work or a faucet that has no hot water? <laughs> that stuff. What I remember it was being, it's actually kind of small. Um, you know, there were bigger rooms in the city. I mean, there by that point, and but it it seemed like I mean it was cool. It had the history and everything. I mean, you just all you had to think is that Hendrix recorded yeah. there and that that kind of you know, and and the albums named the same thing. I mean, it's just right. you know, it's 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 really cool i'm sure it's it's you know they they updated it a lot but it was you know it's small the lounge there was like small as i remember it um and i don't remember what worked or didn't what i remember of course is you know what's impressive is like the gold records on the wall which are like 
kind of everything that you guys and me love. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, because all through from late sixties, all through the seventies, and this is now into the eighties that I was there. They're making these great records there. So all that stuff in the seventies that went yeah. down there, you know, that have including, I believe, I think Kiss when they were Wicked Lester. I'm pretty sure they recorded there, and and uh, I don't know if they even recorded any of the first Kiss stuff there, but I think I remember that that those guys were that's where they were recording. It was just one yeah. of the good studios. I have a question about, and then we'll move forward. Now you, you mentioned that Rick Rubin was your roommate. Was he your freshman roommate? Like uh, you're both incoming freshmen, and this was before he was Rick Rubin that we know. Like, well, I'll tell you who he was. He was I was a freshman. He was a senior, uh, not a senior, a sophomore. So he was in his second year, and he, um, you know, he certainly, uh, yeah, that's the room. That photograph in the lower left. That's they, they, they brought him back there for some some uh, documentary project, um, and he. So he kind of knew the ropes of being in the dorm. I was as, as new as could be. And um, what, but remember that, you know, we we're, were only uh, roommates for that first year, my first year, his, his second year, but we stayed friends. I mean, we kind of liked each other. And so, um, you know, even though he kind of moved around the dorm a little bit and, and was roommates with some other people, uh, not, not people that kind of went on to do anything in the business. They were just, you know, people that were whatever, somebody, a finance student or whatever, but yeah. he kind of he outgrew the doom. I mean, when I met him, he already had formed Def Jam Records, although he's, he it was not to put out hot hip hop yet. It was to put out his punk records. OK, all right. Yeah, because we we're we we're a little confused because I knew Def Jam, you know, and then there was Def American or was that a. Yes subsidiary was that the rock label what was that all about okay so so rick had def jam records he had formed it um at least i i believe in 1982 because it was there by the time i met him in the fall of 82 and he showed it to me and it's amazing you already had the 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 this the logo that you know and the thing with the tone arm and everything it was already set back then for punk records um and so he he had that in i think it was 1985 a few years later he he had by this point met russell simmons and they formed up still use the name def jam but like we're now partners in def jam and they made records for a while and then what you have is the the kind of um the, the records were successful obviously yep and then what you have is the divergence of taste between these two they weren't enemies or anything but they just were like Russell was very interested in making R and B records, like like uh, which Ruben was not interested in. Like Russell clearly was thinking about like Motown and Stax and wanting to go that direction uh, of record making. Ruben was not interested in that. He brought in stuff like Slayer, which Russell didn't understand, and and uh, and think things like that. And you know, Beastie Boys obviously they got, but it just was like kind of guys who came together at the right moment worked together and then divergent tastes. So Ruben left Def Jam, just walked away, left it, goes to the West coast and forms Def American. And then he basically makes an output deal with Geffen. And then he just goes and signs and puts out all these metal bands that he was liking. And so you start having trouble and, and uh Slayer of course goes with him. Yeah. And, uh, Oh man, we got we got Wolfsbane and uh Danzig, of course, the Four Horsemen, all this all this great kind of more metal stuff that Russell never would have would have kind of gotten around to. Great story. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> Adam, you know, speaking about the the worlds that started colliding in that early 80s of rock and rap, I mean, it's it, no secret here that this is one of your big works of art i'd love to go back a little bit and hear some of the stories about these videos but um you know another point is i uh just daryl mcdaniels from run dmc i don't know if you know this but he's got a metal side project band and uh and i, I he was able to play a little club club called dingbats in jersey at the end of april and i went to see the show it was cool number one but i got to talk to him about it and we're gonna eventually get him on our show but man he's all into metal like he's not a guy that just 
claims to say, oh, I'll wear an ECDC or a Metallica T-shirt and I'm going to be cool about it. This guy knows his shit, man. So I know those worlds have grown a long time for a long period of time. But anyway, let's go into the the, the beastie stuff. Like, where was he shot? Like, what were these days like? How'd Kerry right. come in? Yeah, all right. well, Kerry's the second part of it. The first part is um, making uh, Fight Fury to Party, which came first. So um, the, the quicker version of it is that the the Rick Rubin is directing the Run DMC movie Tough in the Leather. He is up to his eyeballs in directing that movie. It, it's it's all in. It's uh, very time consuming, and at the same moment they dropped the Beastie Boys' first single, "Fight Fury at the Party." But nobody outside of maybe a few people in New York or something had seen these guys or knew what they looked like. Few people saw them on the Madonna tour the year before, but they were, wow. they were booed off the stage, you know. So they like they they were not memorable. Nobody nobody really cared. So. All of a sudden, this single drops, and um, any market they dropped it in, for instance, when it played like on a rock station in Detroit, all of a sudden, same thing happened in every market. The phones would light up, and people, and when are you going to play it again? And that happened. We were hearing this stuff coming in. You know, each any city that started to play it, whatever the rock station was, it lit up the phones. Nobody had ever heard anything like that before. So it was like. All of a sudden, they needed a music video in two weeks for MTV. Ruben probably would have directed that video had he not been like snowed under with with directing Run DMC. So he turns to Rick Manello, my co-director and co-writer, and he says, "You're going to direct the, the video." And the Beastie Boys know Rick Manello, and he's he was like the guru of film. He was a film student from NYU, about ten years older than me and Rick, and uh, and so Manello is like, all right, I'll direct it, but if Dubin will do it with me, because Manello knew a lot about film, but he had never actually directed or produced anything before, and I had. So so I was like, I'm on it. The Beasties knew me by that point. And so it was like, they were like, fine. They they really just wanted to get a music video on MTV because they were, MTV was holding a space in, in heavy rotation, which was like God at the time. That was like it. So... Uh, um. So we go off, we write a music video. We didn't have much money. And we wrote this kind of series of gags that were like the, the Beastie Boys crashed the party. And then, you know, kind of these gags happen and everything. Uh, they were totally down for it. Um, it kind of showed who they were in a fun way and a cool way. And, and you know, whatever. It, it, I mean, as I think back on it, I mean, it was just like a, a race to get the, the thing done. It was, you know, you weren't thinking about art or is this great or is this going to be cool? We, we just thought, well, it should be pretty cool, but like, we don't have much money. So just invite all your friends and like, we'll have this party and we'll throw pies at the end. Um, and then for each of the lyrics, we kind of worked out some gags. All right. So that was cool. We got it done in the two week time period, got it up on MTV and voila. I mean, powered by a, a great song, it became a, a great music video that people really enjoyed. So now America knew who the Beastie Boys were. Even the world could see who the Beastie Boys were. And that kind of captured a piece of their, their character. Adam, um, I have a question. Were they, was that their personality? Was that the type of people they were in reality? Fun guy, silly, drinking beers and that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, they were even a little, sometimes a little more serious than that. And sometimes they, they were up for causing a bit of trouble though. They were punk rockers. I remember them from the Lower East Side and, and from, from CBGBs and stuff. For years before that, and they were just they were just a bunch of you know, like you know young high school kids who were up for causing a bit of trouble. You know what I mean? Not terrible trouble. They weren't yeah. awful. But they were you know they were. I mean they, they you know they weren't they weren't bullies. They weren't walking around town beating up on yeah. you know ganging up on people. <laughs> but they were like you know whatever. They, they they were definitely the kind of guys that were messing stuff up. I mean well, one memory that I have very distinct from the dorm was when they started to visit Ruben in the dorm. Ruben and I were not roommates at this point but we were friends and they were always coming in and they were, they were, you know, either them or their kind of cohorts were tagging up the elevators, tagging everything up. But that was a serious thing in NYU. Like Ruben who signed them in, he could get thrown out of the dorm. If you sign somebody into the dorm, you're vouching for them. So if they, yeah. they whatever 
they do in the dorm. You, you're you're good for it. You can get in trouble. So they were messing stuff up. And I was asked a number of times about, you know, if, if I knew something about that. And I was like, no, I don't know anything. And I tell Rick that they're, you know, they're looking for you, man. You better, you know, keep keep a lid on it because they were trying to recognize some of the the signs that that the the you know not gang signs but just stuff that the beasties were like scrawling all over the the dorm and the elevators so i mean that they were that kind of kids you know what i mean they made maybe some some light vandalism here or there but you know uh-huh. nothing nothing any of us didn't get up to at some point or another and and so they were you know the, that kind of the video kind of they were all in on that characterization they were, you got to remember the fight for at the party was supposed to be the anti frat boy song. Now, yeah. interestingly, somewhere along the line, I wouldn't say in the music video, it turned around. It probably turned around somewhere when they went on tour and they had the girl in the cage and they're pouring beer on her. They, they since disavowed all that, but it's like at the time they, they, you know, that was at the point when they, they became what they were spoofing in a sense. But the music video we didn't do that even in the no sleep till brooklyn there's no we didn't you know we we had a model in there but we weren't pouring beer on her you know we, we she was just a girl <laughs> dancing at the rock club you know it's like so so they were kind of they were fun i mean the beast boys were fun and funny they were smart guys that, which which is of course borne out later by the fact that you know look at all they did after def jam i i, I always say that that's really why they're in the rock Roll Hall of Fame. It's not because of Fife Yard to parties, because of, you know, I think became like a really solid, you know, you can't even say a rock and roll act or, uh, or even a uh, hip hop act. They were everything, you know, yeah. they were the whole package and they could make their own videos and produce their own records. Um, so once, once Fife Yard to party was successful, they were like, you know, uh, you know, the, the record company was really happy and they were like, well, we're just going to do the same thing again. And then the next single was No Sleep to Brooklyn. And so they were like, okay, same thing. There was a little bit more money now, but it was the same idea. It was like a kind of a gag fest, but this time at like a, a you know, in, in a kind of heavy metal show. So if you remember um, the original version of, no sleep till Brooklyn starts with a preamble thing. One of those, like, just like the way fight starts with like a little sketch before. Yeah. And then, it, mm-hmm. and then it yeah. so Rick Manello, play, my co-writer, co-director plays the, the, you know, the manager of the, of the rock club and the Beast Boys show up and they go, Hey man, we're, you know, we're the band. And he goes, band, where's your instruments? And then he breaks the record over, you know, over <laughs> their heads. Uh, and then they show up in their, you know, heavy metal attire. But that was, you know, that was kind of a a dig against club owners and people in the metal community who didn't get it. And like, I want to kind of you guys understand, because you guys were there. And if you just remember back that a lot of people, there, there was kind of this, that like oh if you don't play an instrument like having a dj on stage with you is not an instrument and it's really just it's just like it's not worthy or you know because people are expecting musicianship on the level of i don't know you know rush or something and so therefore this is not worthy and we you know the bc boys wanted to take a shot at that basically that attitude and so that was like yes it's funny that we opened that way but it kind of had that had some real teeth to it, you know? And, and so it's like, you know, we just start up doing, doing gags and it was, and it's fun. And we put in, we tried to get as ridiculous as we, as we couldn't just remember um, Spinal Tap already existed for like a couple of years in the world, but so you have to sort of out Spinal Tap, Spinal Tap to spoof anything. So that's why we put them in a suit of armor. And I mean, it's just, you know, it's just silliness. And and fun, but they were again. They were up for the game. I mean, they wanted to do stuff, and uh, Yauk was totally up for machine gunning the the, the Martian <laughs> speakers, and you know, it was just playing with that. Now, but, Kerry King comes into the go the, ahead. But, now, b- before I we go into the Kerry King uh, part, my interpretation of the Beastie Boys was they're they were fun. They were like good buddies goofing around, sort of like in a good way, immature frat boys, even though they're against you know, the whole frat thing, yeah. but you're right. They never really did anything malicious. It was always yeah. just 
having fun and goofiness and don't take things too seriously. That's that's what I always got out of the Beastie Boys. And I think white kids to like rap, right? Like there was none yeah. of that stuff before. Like you could you could be cool with rap and be like, oh my god, look at these three white guys, right from uh, from New York City. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, well, you just hit it exactly on the head. That's exactly what it was. It was okay for white kids to to rap. Uh, the genre was big enough. I mean, as we see, it's become like a world music. I mean, there's rap in every single language now. now you know what I mean? It's because it's expressing feeling a lot of it rage uh, or uh, at injustice yeah. in, in every culture now that, that, that supports it. But what's interesting about that, and, and this is props back to Ruben already knew this. He knew it the, when I met him in 1982, he was telling me that like, there's going to be white rappers, you know, he ab absolutely knew it because he just understood it for what it was, that it was essentially punk music. There was not a difference. I, I still yeah. thought there was a difference. I had to learn. He was already there. Um, but the real credit on that goes to Russell Simmons, who when in in breaking the Beastie Boys, he he as soon as they started actually doing the rap thing, and they admit themselves in their book and everything that they felt they were like worried about being inauthentic. You know, they were kind of worried like, can we do this? You know, and he took them right up to the hardcore, um, you know, hip hop clubs in the Bronx, and and threw them in at the deep end because it was kind of if if they if they could pull it off there i mean russell actually said this quote that that if that if they weren't taken seriously by the by the black audience then all they'd ever be is fake white rappers there you so go. His, his thought was and his and you know to his great credit was to break them at black clubs now of course you know he could team them with some of his acts and everything but the end run Three white boys had to get out there on stage and and do it. And and uh, we know from like the Apollo that the audience there will not tolerate, yeah. you know, posers or any uh, any more than obviously our our friends in the metal community will tolerate posers. Ah. So <laughs> like they, they did it. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what. And of course, blaze the trail for every single white rapper that could ever be after it. Eminem, yeah. Yeah. on and on. You know? Yeah, McLemore, all that. It's yeah. it's true. Uh, Kerry King, how'd that get involved? The obvious okay. reason? Yeah, I mean, look, Kerry played the, the you know, song like No Sleep for Brooklyn. It needed a heavy metal guitar solo. So at this point, uh, Slayer was under contract already. And Ruben liked that kind of cross-pollinating with, uh, with label mates and everything. They were they weren't friends or anything. It's not like Slayer and the Beasties were friends. There was none mm -hmm. of that. Uh, but it was just like, you know, in, in the studio, he got, he got Carrie to play the solo, which is the solo we know. And then it came to the music video. And Ruben was very adamant about wanting uh, Carrie to be in the music video. Um, the Beasties were not so much into that. They didn't care so much about having Carrie they surely didn't want to be upstaged in their own video. I mean, remember, they're still pretty new to the game. They're ex exactly one music video in at this point. You know what I mean? It's like five going to film No Sleep Till Brooklyn. So it's not like, oh, their their career is assured at this point. They've got one hit. You know what I mean? That's it. So now it's like, wait a minute. There's this other guy now who's going to be in, and he's going to get this blaze this moment of a blazing guitar solo you know what i mean so they were kind of the beasties were very skeptical about that and they weren't that into it and you know they we could have like done gags and the idea had come up to to have a chimp come in and play wacky kind of video so there was a chimp at the time. He this chimp would be on David Letterman from time to time and everything. Yeah. His name's Zippy the Chimp. I remember and that. Remember Zippy the Chimp? Yeah. yeah. And he he could roller skate too. He'd come out on roller <laughs> skates and everything. He was just on a bunch of shows and stuff. He would, you know, whatever. He was a thing of the of the moment. And so we we called up to to see about getting Zippy the Chimp, and that was the idea. And the BC was like kind of okay with that, you know, like they'd be in the background. Zippy the Chimp comes in with a guitar, and we called up in the we got a hold of the trainer and everything. And um, uh, that was a great idea, but Zippy the Chimp was $1,500. And uh, so I still remember it to this day. That's because $1,500 was like 
like way more dollars than anybody else on that entire video was getting by a lot. And so yeah, like Ruben like nicks that idea. And so then the idea was like, all right, there's no Zippy the Chimp. Well, it can't just be Carrie because that's upstaging. So it's like, all right, what if we get a gorilla suit? Because a gorilla suit rents for $50. Well, $50 is more like the kind of budget we had. So mm. I was like, now, you guys have seen enough Three Stooges and Abbott and Costellos and all that stuff to know that a gorilla suit is just funny because it's there. I mean, when the guy shows up with a gorilla suit, it's already yeah. good. So I just was like, well, if anybody's wearing the gorilla suit, I'm wearing the gorilla suit. There's not going to be another person in the gorilla suit if there's a gorilla suit. So I'm like, I put on the gorilla suit. I got out there and I had have, I have the guitar and everything. And I just was like, let me, you know, let me like, like just do this. And then the, then we come out, just do the first bar or so of the song and then get shoved out of the way by Kerry, who like does what Kerry King does. So I could say that I definitely felt the, the nails in the, in my back yeah. as he shoved me out of the way. <laughs> so those nails are for real, man. So uh, it, it was like kind of a compromise that proved to be the best of, of everything. You know, I have a quick comment. Somewhere in Ruben's thinking and philosophy, because obviously seems to be three steps ahead, was the including of Carrie King sort of the same thing as like an Eddie Van Halen on Beat It, where they're trying to appease two different types of uh, music crowds, you know, because, hey, I was there in 82 and 83 when I when the girl next door said, hey, your guy Eddie Van Halen's on my Michael Jackson album. I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> but. Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Five years later, it's the same thing. Try to. Yeah, I don't know. All right. I can't, I can't speculate on that. And that Ruben never said to me. Either or trying to do that. But. I mean, you got to remember, here's the guy who gave us walk this way. And, and it was not, you know, it's like Steve Tyler and, and Joe Perry were not, they weren't really aware of rap. And Run DMC were pretty ambivalent about, you know, doing anything with Aerosmith. They didn't see it either. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this is, I'm saying all through, this has already been acknowledged in like mm -hmm. numerous interviews. Ruben's the one who saw it and brought them together. So I think he felt it was, I, I don't think he felt it was so much like, like um, Eddie Van Halen on a, on a Michael Jackson track as much as it was much more in his mind of, of, I think recognizing, and, and on this, again, he is three steps ahead, that the fan of the Beastie Boys could also be a fan of Slayer, and it is not exclusive, mutually exclusive or anything, like, like oh, you're a rap fan and this guy's a metal fan. Nope. He saw it as that kid in middle America could be a fan of both those things, and and it's just... He felt like a, any fan of a Slayer could just as much dig that beastie track. And I think, you know, history has certainly proven that out too. It certainly has. And we all know that metal heads are very territorial. We're yeah. talking with Adam Dubin. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, the eighties come to the nineties, things get heavy and the real powerhouse metalers get involved. We'll be right back. This is metal mayhem ROC. All right. Well, you pick it up. Um, you obviously have an enormous relationship with Metallica and you've done so much amazing work that we, we couldn't cover it in an hour episode, but, uh, excuse let's me, try to go me, through. Uh, uh, well, uh, re re-entry on that, uh, sort of say, um, so, you know, build it up a little better. Okay. Say the eighties are ending in the nineties, then go that okay. way. Okay. So the eighties are ending and it's time to move into the 90s and metals in its fullest force of popularity. Uh, Adam then gets a chance to work with the biggest metal band in the world, Metallica. So we are going to hear all about the next stage of his career as a professional uh, filmmaker. And Adam, just off the bat, talk about the Nothing Else Matters video. I mean, John and I were looking at this stat that popped up on, uh, I think it's your Facebook, that that video seen, what, a billion views? Yeah, apparently. I mean, I picked it up off of Lars Ulrich, his uh, his um, 
I don't know, his feed somewhere on uh, Twitter or, or Instagram or something, when he picked it up, that there was a billion views and he like, you know, drew this mind blown thing on it. And uh, yeah, it's pretty mind blowing. I guess, I guess it is, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, just on, uh, on YouTube or whatever, that that's been viewed a billion times. That is, that's pretty wild. Apparently that's also uh, some, you know, rare territory, but uh, very cool. That's not, it's nice that, you know, people keep finding that track and enjoy it, you know, and the music. And this is, this is the first Metallica track, I think for that, where they started crossing over, right? And then you had one that came out that video, but it was still heavy. You get into the black album and this becomes maybe the third single or so. I don't remember, but you know, you can't call this like a ballad or anything, but this is their softer side, which was the first of its kind, but look what it did to their career. Right. Yeah. I mean, just that right. in of itself is an amazing piece that they stepped out of their own comfort zone. Yeah. So, you know, this music video was a culmination of, of uh, over a year of. You know, the, yeah, the, the, as, as you pointed out in the beginning, the 80s turned to the 90s in 1990. I was I've been making music videos for you know a number of years now. It's after the Beastie Boys. By the way, my, my Beastie Boy career was just those two videos with them, and then they went off to the West Coast. And I, you know, other than seeing them once in a while, I, I, I had no further contact with them. But I was making music videos, and you know, one day get a call that Metallica, who I did not know yet, uh, were going to go into the studio to do whatever their next record's going to be. Nobody knows yet. Um, it's just the fifth. Metallica record that's all and you know they may want to film stuff do you would you like to talk with them about it oh sure I'd love to talk with them about it so we knew some people in common by this point I mean I'd been doing a lot of work for Danzig and stuff like this so there was you know I was probably gonna meet and talk to them at some point but anyway I, I met them on this day um it was very clear from the out from get-go that like Lars was interested in filming this and um James was not and and I just showed them what I could do. I said, let me try it and I'll film a little bit. And, you know, I, I kind of thought, well, this is probably going to amount to nothing. It was nice to meet the guys in Metallica for a minute. And um, it was, at the time I met him, it was just Lars and James there. And uh, and two weeks later or something, I got a phone call. Yeah, they want you to come film, but it's a, it's probationary. If they don't like it, they're going to throw you out. Um, the whole thing is supposed to take only um, four months. Ha, huh? you know, it took 10 to make that record. But it was, um, you know, I just started doing what I do. I just started filming and documenting. This now was much closer to what I felt about Woodstock, which was, you know, this thing that inspired me and also other great documentaries by uh, the documentarian D.A. Pennebaker, who um, really is the godfather of all, all uh, you know, kind of rock documentary. Uh, great, great uh, cinematographer. Um, and... You know, I'm filming 16. I pushed for this to film 16 millimeter film because I wanted it to look classic. I wanted it to look like this was something looks the way, um, you know, don't look back looks, you know, and, and just all these great rock documentary things. So, uh, you know, to that great credit, Metallica sprung for the many more dollars that it is to shoot on, on film. And what we have is this tremendous record of a document of them creating what turned out to be the biggest album of their career. And indeed one of the biggest albums of all time, you know, it's up there in, in like um, back in black territory, you know, yeah. and whatever the most classic rock albums are, you know, and everything like that. It's up there with like, you know, the hotel California's and the, and the stereo yeah. heaven, all, all, every, everything that's, that's huge. That's where that record is. But they didn't know it at the time. I mean, they were just making this record, but we could hear it. Those, the few of us who were in the studio could hear like, oh my God, this, like I I even knew, like as I'm listening to these songs go down, like, yeah, this is not just the next Metallica record. This is pretty epic. I mean, we hear like Enter Sandman coming together. You're like, oh, okay, wait a minute. This is like, I mean, I, I was like, I think it's good, but I'm like, no, this is really good. So the band, you know, finishes the record the song just, you know, and, and you guys remember these days when, yeah. when Enter Sandman comes out, followed by the next single, Unforgiven. I mean, it was just devouring rock radio and, yeah. and kind of bringing in new fans. 
And then new fans were discovering, going back and discovering the, the older records, which were also great and were kind of like, I, I think, you know, what was like a very, very, you know, on the edge thrash record at the time. But I mean, if, if in 91 or 92, you're a, a metal fan and you love, um, you really love Metallica, then I, I think it's probably a great discovery to go back and find Ride the Lightning in there someplace, you know, or Master Puppets sitting there waiting for you. So um, I got a call. They wanted to try to use the footage that we shot for what would be the third music video, uh, which off the album or the, then the third single was Nothing Else Matters. And the idea was obviously it's it's a, it's a kind of a love song without saying the word love in it. Yeah. But it's you know, and it's I don't know if it's a ballad. It's to me, there's a lot of hard rock songs that 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 build like that. Um, you know, it, but at the at the time they they just wanted it to, you know, they didn't want to do a concept video because that would have been difficult and and they they and also expensive by the way. And they had spent all this money shooting this doc footage. So I think Lars. And Peter Mensch were like, yeah, let's let's see if let's give it a shot. So they gave me an editing budget. I went away for a couple of weeks, edited the video that. And I remember I was not home at the time and I wish to hell that I'd kept. Remember when uh, answering machines had little tapes? Yes. That you put in? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody thought to keep these things. But I get this. I was out. I mean, who knows when? And Lars was calling from someplace in the world. He would call at odd hours. I mean, really odd hours. Like they were touring the world. So I'd get phone calls about stuff at, you know, two in the morning, three in the morning, waking me up because he's on the other side of the planet. But we'd have to work. And he left a message and it was like, Woo, you did it. They were they were really thrilled. And. We finished up, you know, that then you go to an online, you actually finish the music video, you make your final cuts on it. And uh boom, there it came out in early 1992, the third music video off the black album, Nothing Else Matters, and uh, supporting a tremendous song. And you know, it's I mean, as Metallica songs go, it's certainly the most accessible song. I mean, even yeah. for people who are not heavy metal people. You know, and and uh, I've heard it's used in a lot of weddings and stuff. I know it was used. certainly accessible to people that are not, that might not listen to any other Metallica song, but would listen to that one. So I think that being the case, it certainly uh, has racked up a lot of listens and a lot of views, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, pretty cool to be a part of that. And it was and it's cool because as you watch that music video, you can actually see how a song is created a little bit, you know, how a recording process works. So it's Adam, I have a question. So when you were, when you were working with this song in particular, were you also documenting what would become a year and a half in the life of Metallica? Was this all happening at the same time? Yes. A good question. It was. Um, so I'm at the time we had filmed obviously the studio part because that was done and the, the record was out, but they were, when I when I started editing Nothing Else Matters, they were embarking on the very beginning of what would become the three year um, tour for the Black Album. Yeah, um, I remember Jason Newstead telling me uh, when I was interviewing a, a couple of years ago that um, he celebrated three birthdays on the Black Album tour. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so that's I mean, that's pretty epic. You know? And so he um. So yeah, they what what they did was it was actually there was a little bit of a moment in between finishing filming the the making of the studio part and it was shortly after I finished editing the music video for Nothing Else Matters that they that the band called up and said, "Okay, we want you to now come out on on the road." So look at that. That's a pretty that's pretty good, good coming from, you know, a couple of years before when they were like, "Ah, we don't know if we're even like okay now we want you to come on the road and uh and and film the hijinks there and and that just kind of kept it going and then yes to answer your question while i was on the road actually filming the black album tour i was also at the same time in the studio in in manhattan editing this whole thing so i was editing the the making of the record and then now the making of the tour simultaneously because you know, I mean, when you have an album, 
it's doing the numbers that it's doing and and it's just keep and it sort of just keeps going you know i mean the yeah. next single after yeah. after this was was wherever i may roam um they i think they they kept going after that i mean there's still great deep songs on that i yeah. mean they they just um they oh sad but true is the one after that yeah. so there you are that's five singles off of, of an album of 12 songs so it's like they wanted another piece of product in the stores for Christmas time, 1992. And so we were on the very heavy deadline to get, uh, get done the, the film, which is, which you now know is a year and a half in the life of Metallica parts one and two. And uh, one being the making of the record, two being the tour, all the music videos are on there. And it just, yeah, it just kind of encapsulates what that year and a half was like for for the Metallica boys at that time. I think I saw that tour for three different birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I saw the first arena. I saw the outdoor tour with the cult. Um, you know, joking aside, um, yeah, yeah, it went on yeah. for three and a half years. And but Adam, props to you, man, because yeah. I have grown up watching this stuff. The I've had the VHSs yeah. and just keep watching yep. and watching and watching. And so needless to say, um, the relationship with Metallica is solidified, which goes on to this day. Uh, yeah. What other stuff? Cunning stunts. What do we have on here? Tell us about the cunning stunts. Um, yeah, I mean, sessions. there's a few of the other, there's a few other documentaries on here that I've done over the years. They, you know, I'm fortunate. They, they remember me. They call me in for special projects when they need, they, they have a team of video guys with them now that's uh, very capable. They generate a ton of social media videos, you know, all the time from all over the world, wherever they are. But um, these special projects would come up. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, you know, in the 90s, they they did uh, this crazy tour called, uh, well, I, I don't know if the tour was called Cunning Stones. So I, I think... Um, they it was a tour whereby the the stage like collapses like it was almost an expansion of like yeah. like you guys yeah. remember the tour where Doris you know collapsed well this was like the yeah. whole stage collapsing and and so I did it the, the Wayne Isham shot the the you know the live film of that but I I did the um the making of 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 that of cunning stunts and that was kind of fun to show how they pulled off all this amazing stuff night after night. And then um, a few years later, they go do S and M, which was the first time they decided to do the the concert thing where they played mm -hmm. in the symphony orchestra. Of course, uh, they, their their music being somewhat almost symphonic in certain ways um, lent itself to it. I, I, and and so uh, that was kind of incredible. And again, I, 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 Wayne Isham again shot the the live show that we did in Berkeley, California, and I did the making of, so you could kind of see how that whole thing came together. Very interesting seeing Metallica work with a set of musicians are, are you know, from a completely different yeah. background or are, are so schooled in, in uh, you know, composition and in classical music, but certainly, you know, got the feel of what Metallica was doing. So that was, that was very neat watching that work out. Um, Hit the Lights was a documentary of, uh, Metallica in um, 2012 started making a, uh, a what would be a film that they were putting together. They wanted to do something narrative, but something that was kind of also a a movie uh, concert film, and because they kind of wanted to take it, they they kind of wanted to do something in in 3D and like an IMAX 3D thing. So um, they came up with this crazy stage that was like you know had a piece of staging from all of their career up to that point. You know, at that, at that point, they were at about a 30th anniversary mark. And so I think it kind of marked that. And again, how do you get it all done? I, w I was filming the the making of how you how you do the making of a, a, you know, this incredible bit of staging that they that they came up with. Um, there's it was done in segments because now the Internet was a thing. And the idea was like, OK, you know, before we ever put this on a DVD or anything, it's going to run on the Internet. So it had to be done in episodic chunks and everything. So I think every every segment was a few minutes, five, six minutes, and uh, really cool stuff. The, the one I always remember that 
I mean, I, I like them all, but the one that really knocks me out is the, um, they had in there a Tesla coil. Now, this is something nobody has. And they lit up the Tesla coil, shooting those electric bolts while Kirk is playing the solo in, in Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning. <laughs> I have to say that as a piece of staging, I have never seen anything like that anybody, that anybody's done. That is the most stunning thing I've ever seen, especially because what they were doing fit the music so well. So that was that was pretty cool. Adam, I, I was, by the way, going back to the uh, Cutting Stunts uh, film, I was at the Garden Show in 97, pretty close up, and I fell for that. I remember being with uh, somebody in the crowd or you know my friend of mine in the audience and they're like Lance you, you gotta go like what, what's going on you gotta get the security yeah. guide like it, it, I fell for it but uh it was definitely a cool little gag that they did and definitely yeah. uh something of its time I, Adam I had a question on your website you show um some of the things that maybe are not commercially released as your its own product but like for example you in, in uh the fan cam three yeah. Um, there's some footage of a, a Philadelphia show from 97 by any chance. Was that the famous parking lot gig? Yes, it was. That was the one was I was the... at that show as well. Yeah. And, uh, I have a little visual of that one here. So I want to talk to you about that day. I mean, that for me, I'll never forget. It was on a Tuesday. It was advertised on Howard Stern and yeah. I'll never forget the, uh, the morning I called in sick to work, I remember one of my buddies, this was pre-cell phone, calling me up and leaving me in on my parents' house phone, being like, hey, uh, <laughs> just by chance, you were at work on a Monday and you were fine, and today you're sick, and Metallica's playing in Philly in a parking lot? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, well, that was a totally killer game. It was, it was great. I remember it was really fun. Yeah, and yeah. We, we were filmed though. I don't know if there was a, a film crew there or whatever, but we, again, it, you know, I, I mean, this, you know, look, what it really represents is look, that was fan cam three. I mean, I remember getting the call when Metallica was doing fan cam one, which would probably go to about 95. And they, I mean, it just shows the connection with the fan base, you know, even as they grew and people and they took their hits for like, Oh, you know, whatever. I think people like, like, you know, original and now it was like it became, they grew they became everybody's thing um but they always wanted to keep that connection to their fans which i still do to this day and so mm -hmm. uh they, they started coming up with something i mean all this was kind of pre-internet so they made these these you know short small video things they try to do something special and and make and a fan can was exactly that a can with like some things you could you know you'd buy it and it'd have a shirt and a bottle opener and a few things and some Maybe a, a show that was never videotape, uh, an actual VHS tape was in there, you know, to kind of give the fans something, uh, you know, the, the true fans who are members of the fan club could like get this, this thing. And, uh, you know, I think that was kind of nice. It was a nice connection to the, to the fans. So yes, the one you're talking about that, that show became fan can number three. That was awesome because I remember, again, not only it being a weird weekday afternoon in a parking lot, it was free, I just had to show up, but I remember they played a little under an hour and a half, but it was like, it wasn't your typical set list. They do in like deep tracks and I remember them playing uh, The Thing That Should Not Be and I was like, wow, that's what, you know, like, who, why would they pick that song for a gig like this? And they pulled some of the, uh, you know, the stuff off Garage Days and stuff like that. So definitely a memorable one for me. But uh, speaking of Garage Days, this one... Um, another great one you were involved with. And I, I loved, I was watching a little bit of the video on YouTube yesterday and a little picture in the bottom, right. I, I found that cool where the guys were just hanging out and I guess they were getting prepped for filming or whatever they were doing, but they were just chilling. Um, talk about this whole moment in time. Um, very fast moment in time. I mean, that was like something, um, you know, I remember Lars saying like they they again because they did not have to write the songs. The songs are all just you know things that they made. You know that they were covering. Sorry that so they had to make just their versions of the song. Um, they um, that was like a record made in three weeks. You know, I mean, essentially recorded in three weeks. And Lars was like really you know happy about that because it was like they you know I think I I think over the years uh metallica number one they they certainly uh are very uh vocal about the 
bands that they like and support. I mean, that, that goes all the way back. And it, indeed in the very first days as, as, uh, as I kind of showed in murder in the front row, they didn't have that many songs. They were doing covers of, of diamond head songs and other things. So the, the band definitely, you know, has a connection with doing and interpreting material that's not their own. And I think, you know, Oh, here they they come to a record like you know they obviously did the uh, what was the five ninety eight EP and then they kind of came to this portion in their in their uh, world where they put out uh, load and reload and they wanted to have something else and they wanted to you know kind of I guess you know pay some respect to to some of the uh, music that they really enjoyed and so they come out with this double disc of of uh, of covers. And uh, there's some great music on there that, yeah. you know, it was fun. Yeah. So it was a very fast project. It was not, it came together fast. It was recorded quickly. Um, and then it was, it was just like, they told me to just cut some stuff together that they were going to just put out there. Uh, so, it, you know, video wise, I don't find it like, uh, like a favorite work in the sense of like, I think I could given time do something better and a lot closer to a year and a half in life Metallica. But at the time they just wanted something out quickly. And so it at least shows what they were working on. That was, that was the idea at the time. Where was this shot? Like the actual garage with the graffiti, was that like a stage thing where you painted up some old building or was it kind of, you remember. found it? I, I didn't. But um, I remember the, the record was made. What was the famous place? It was in Sausalito, California. I think the record plant yeah, or something. Yeah. Like that. And it's like, that was a, um, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of stuff had been recorded there, very famous records and everything. But it was just before they they got like HQ set up as that they could record there and and like kind of create their own recording situation. And before we turn the corner on this and get into the murder in the front row and some of your other smaller projects, uh, the Metallica in Antarctica. What was that all about? And I watched the video. It's totally cool. Give us the lowdown on that gig. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, this band has been so amazing and so amazing to me. Um, and if, if you could pick like kind of something that stands out of, 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 out of all the incredible things that have happened that I've done with this band, if you could pick something that's, stands out it's got to be going to antarctica um it, it's just and i uh, just never thought i'd get to do it with them um but i i'm a, you know i've kind of read a lot about antarctica so it was like really kind of special thing um apparently there was a couple things going on one the band was on tour they were th that year in 2013 they were they were on tour and they um they had, they had already played all the other continents. And so like kind of this thing came, I mean, things are always coming to them. You got to understand they're, they're kind of because of who they are, opportunities of various on the door in the form yeah. of sending stuff to Q prime and, and asking. So this came down the pike and it was from, I believe Coke zero in, in South America. There's obviously various parts of the world where Coca-Cola is active in promotion this was the promotion going on in South America. Um, and it was like, they decided to, you know, say yes to this one. Uh, Coke is obviously a very well-funded well company and would do things to promote. And so this was mm -hmm. put together as a promotion funded by Coke Zero. And Coke Zero took uh, not just Metallica to the, to the bottom of the earth in Antarctica, but you need fans. And they took, I think it was something like 20 or 30 uh, fan <laughs> club people from South American fan clubs and they played now then all these logistics come into it so it's like how do you play there um, first of all you got to be by one of the bases and in, in this play, case they picked the Argenti Argentinian base um, that's on Antarctica what things you need you have electricity you have uh, these powerful satellites that can uplink it to the world um, we went in December, which is the summer there in, of, of, uh, Antarctica. And, and then it was like, how do you do it and not disturb this pristine environment? Because that's kind of, you know, one of the things that is sacred amongst all the research scientists working there is like to preserve the environment, to not have 
too much of man's footprint on on this and so uh, any more necessary so they created something again another first that metallica does they created this geodesic dome and and they uh yes and so as not to have loud amps which would certainly disturb the abundant wildlife there they they played but people had individual headsets and so the music was piped into the headsets so again myself as a documentarian i have to kind of show how all this comes together and how they do this and and it was that was really incredible and then even part of the, the day i mean it was amazing that they played it's amazing it all worked Put it into this dome to see them uh, and also what was amazing scientists <laughs> and their families or whatever came from all over they were the other bases. I mean, obviously, I guess if you're at the bottom of the world, you get to know the other people around you because there's not many people. And they came, they, they were coming over on snowmobiles and everything else, snow cats and driving over. And they would, you know, I mean, here's Metallica playing at the bottom of the world. So the scientists came in and everything. And, um, and what was interesting was watching Metallica also go explore this area part of the day i'd say we were down there for for like at most a couple of days maybe 36 hours and um and, but the guys in the band got into zodiac boats and went with um uh these you know there's these phd scientists that 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 run these boats and they take you and they can explain uh all about like they're either biologists or geologists or you know but very very smart uh and, and learned people who are studying down there and and they're uh and they took us and they showed us around and it was really interesting to get that extra perspective and i think the metallica guys were really you know that was part of it for them it wasn't to just go there play and come home it was like you know what can we what can we learn about this place what can we what can we do here so that was again reflected in the documentary and i guess the the high point of the documentary beyond the music is that uh we got a very close like close encounter of the first kind with this pod of whales that came over and like we're right next to our boat. I mean, like, like went under our, our boat, you know, could have swamped the boat, you know, if they wanted to, uh, but we're, I guess more peaceful and curious and just came by. It was, but it was a little <laughs> bit alarming because, you know, when you're up close, they're, they're huge, you know, then you, you realize you have no control here. Nobody does. You, you have to just sit and see what they're going to do, you know? Wow, what an experience. And yeah. th this is on the, uh, it was almost like 15 years earlier, 10 years earlier, when the band was up at the top of the world on Tuck the Yuck Duck. Yeah. Remember, so remember that gig? Sponsored by uh, another beverage company. That was Molson. Molson. Ice. Was Polar it? Ice, I think. Yeah. yeah. It was like whatever that, Mol I think the, 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 the brew is Molson Ice, but it was the Polar Ice concert. Anyway, again, another thing that they took on and they went to pretty much the top of the world i mean they weren't at the north pole exactly but even when we went to antarctica we weren't at the south pole we were just in the the area of it <laughs> um and they uh they played this other promotional concert this was in the very early days in the internet that was 1995 and i remember that was one of the first things i remember streaming out into the world and like being like oh wow they're doing that and um, people must have been watching it on their AOL dial-up in a screen. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they played with Veruca Salt, and our, yeah, and and Hole played. Hole was yeah. Really there, I and, back yeah. in my archives, I still have the um, T-shirt because our local at the time alternative station, the Nerve, yeah. they were sponsoring I, it. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So it was like kind of another. I mean, again, I, I just think you know this band is incredible i mean they they you know lars has said this stuff to try to do interesting things not all the time just weird interesting stuff and you know sometimes it sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but they, i i think what you got to say about them is that they're not afraid to try so i mean whenever you know whenever anybody has a beef about that lulu album it's fine but at least they're not afraid to try doing yep. something like that you know yeah. what i mean i think I think it's much worse for your creativity if you're going to be a creative being the way they are to be afraid oh you know what if my fans don't like it i mean a lot may not like it maybe some will but man you you know you took a swing with lou reed i mean you gotta try yeah. stuff like that you know
Sounds like they should uh, write a song called Of Whalen Man as like a part two to Of Wolf and Man. <laughs> well, well said. Well said. Well, they, they, they should do that. That would, yes. That would next be. time you speak to Lars, tell him that we, uh, we're going to help him with the songwriting on that next song, okay? Of Whalen Man. I think it'd be great. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorites is the most recent, well, is the Murder in the Front Row documentary. Uh, what Superbly done. The whole San Francisco music the thrash scene tell us a little bit about this because this adam this is fantastic and i love these bands and i've heard this story thank you so um again this is and this is my work uh murder front row as a movie is my work it's not it's not um sponsored by metallica in any way although they supported me greatly in it and Mm -hmm. so here's what it was in the course of um work number of the original fans like these there's a bunch of a group of fans who are like original OG fans from from San Francisco when the band migrated up the coast to San Francisco and two of those fans Brian Liu and Harold Oyman made a book called Murder in the Front Row lines that are taken from an Exodus song and it's filled with photographs of the early Bay Area thrash scene. Um, some, a lot of the photographs, I mean, there's a bunch of Metallica, but really it's it's pretty mixed with a lot of the other early metal bands as, as you know, even the, even like Slayer and, and, and Megadeth, which were not uh, Bay Area bands, but, but certainly found uh, a willing audience in the Bay Area. And so there's a lot of great photographs of those guys coming through. And the Bay Area supported all that all that metal that that came there and spawned a great deal of it. So a lot, you know, you could definitely say the thrash metal scene uh, certainly had a lot going for it in in uh, the Bay Area. So there was this book called Murder in Front Row, and I basically, as a filmmaker, I fell in love with the book, and I and, and it's mostly a book of pictures. And I realized that there was a lot more to it than even was spoken about in the stories in the book. So I uh, contacted Brian and Harold and I, you know, told them and they knew me at this point, but they did not just give me their story. They were like, I said, I'd like to make a film of it. And they first wanted to make sure that I was going to make it, you know, in a way that honored the tradition of the Bay area thrash. And by that, I mean, uh, at what we did was that we decided we approached it something like this. There was a moment in time when, let's say, Metallica first went up to San Francisco, and this would be in the fall of 19, you know, spring in the fall of uh, 1982. Maybe it was fall 82. Anyway, that like James Hetfield was no more famous than the kid standing there watching it with him. You know what I mean? And they're the same age and they're rocking out together. And so we kind of approached it like that, that like, really as much a part of the story as any of the metal guys that you want to you want to you know talk about and so we took it from that very earliest period and one of the great you know i think uh things that we managed to highlight was really the contribution the very powerful contribution of kirk hammett to the bay area thrash scene um because you got to remember kirk hammett uh formed exodus even before lars and james formed metallica and he's pursuing it may not have been exactly a thrash band at the time but he's helping create thrash in the bay area and he doesn't even know who james and lars are you know and he's doing this so um Mm -hmm. it really you know kind of showed that uh and so i kind of you know filmed the movie i filmed all these interviews um i filmed a lot of interviews before metallica sat for my cameras but they did sit for my cameras over the course of a week where they did a three night stand in uh Mexico City, and the picture on the left is me and my wife, uh, Rochelle, who's also a producer on the movie. Cool. With our friend, uh, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, very famous luchadors there, and a huge fan of Metallica, and he's he got a little cameo in the movie, and it was really, it's really like, kind of great, and we and we just one after another, just it was so great that people honored us by sitting for our cameras, and so we have uh, Tom Araya, who you see there. We, we filmed on on uh it was towards the end of, of the um they hadn't announced yet but it was it was slayer you know was kind of uh, in the, the tail end of slayer's career 
uh, but they still sat for us. Gary Holt, Paul Do Bostaff at the time. In another interview, um, I, I was able to get, um, I don't know, let me see, who else did we get there? Uh, uh, we got Mustaine, we got Ellison. So we really got a lot of the people that were that were part of this. And, uh, you know, kind of people, as we were filming, people were kind of hearing from the from the community, which keeps in touch in the Thrash community, that we were like the good guys. We were telling the story the right way. We were honoring the the, the fans. And and so I think that was, you know, got and, and you know, the I mean, it's what you wish would happen is as always, you make a film, you don't know what the reception is gonna be. You hope it's good. In this case, it was very good. The 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 uh you know, the fan base really enjoyed the the movie. I I went to as many screenings as I could. We had a long theatrical run before the video run and one of the amazing things guys was that that the um there was there was you know people bringing their kids to the screenings of the movie because they were showing them the history a lot of times the, yeah. the was had been in the thrash community he may have cut his hair he may have whatever but he's <laughs> still you know that's the where his heart is and he's showing his son or daughter yeah, this is this is what I was part of. This is and it's something, and it mattered. It's history, and it mattered, and that happened so many times. I can't even count or tell you. And then there's like the younger fans who never were there for that, you know. But like here, they're watching, like where this music was developed from. And then there's the OG fans like you guys who were there yeah. for yep. a good piece of it, and they're like reliving a piece of their their history with the film. So, so many amazing things. And it's great that, you know, there should be more documents like this. I think there, there was a guy who I interviewed later. He's not in, in Murder in Front Row, but I did interview him for this Metallica project uh, named Bob Nalbandian. And unfortunately he passed away. Yeah, I know Bob. But I mean, uh, you know, no greater lover of heavy metal than he. And, and he also had made a, a project of documenting a lot of, a lot of this and putting together his documentaries and it's nice to make a shout out to him now, but it's also nice that we need more people documenting this history. That's all. That's just something I'll state here. I want to say really the star of this murder in the front row isn't so much the bands and the footage. It's like you said, the, 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 the owner of Ruthie's Inn, the girls that used to feed these guys, the um, the lady that had the house and the people, if they didn't have anywhere to sleep, that they she would actually yeah. pay for stuff. It was everything. And you know what, Adam, what the really cool thing is, you mentioned what these people are doing now. The one gal is what she works for the. Um, the government, the, she's a, she's really a yeah. uh, rocket scientist or something. And it's yeah, just, that was Paul Bailoff's girlfriend. Uh, and she was, uh, she became a nuclear scientist, yeah. you know, working on the nuclear weapons to protect our country. You know, it's like, I mean, it's like, but I love showing that stuff. I love that it was some kind of ridiculous idea that that you know and, and and you guys go back long enough i mean you remember how and i'll say we the metalheads were portrayed in the 80s right it was the pmrc and we were all metal burnouts and we were going to be like the you know, <laughs> devil worshipers and we're we're a plague uh -huh. to society well it's all these years later <laughs> nobody's a plague to society <laughs> you know the the, the 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 it's like the who said the kids are all right you know and and that's what it, that's what it is and this everything because it's what they always were they were you know the smart kids they motivated um a lot of what comes out i think metal now is just what it was then which is um there was a few people who said uh they had a tough childhood you know with all kinds of rough situations in their childhood that mm -hmm. we all know about that you know could be any number of things and what was there for them metal that metal community and and their, their friends that they could they could share that with and get them through those hard times. Amen. A amen. Hey, Adam, just a, a small comment on uh, like the fathers and sons related to the the documentary. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting as Metallica's coming up to playing this Jersey show in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, his son's band uh, is booked a bunch of little gigs. 
yeah. in uh, in the week leading up to it. I think it's called Bastardane or something like that. I haven't seen him yet, yeah. but it, it, it's cool for me because my hometown I grew up in as a kid is called Kearney, New Jersey in Hudson County. And they're yeah. doing a little gig there on a Tuesday night in a little corner bar. And you know damn well I'm going because I'm sure as hell hoping that proud Papa is going to be in the back with his sunglasses on drinking a seltzer, watching his kid <laughs> play on a Tuesday night in front of 50 people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have had an opportunity to see uh, the, the baby bands and uh, it's, you know, yeah. it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Bastardine and Otto are both touring uh, alongside the, you know, the, the, uh, the mighty Metallica. And uh, I think it's even, you know, I think that's great. And I think, it's 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 cool i mean you know why not uh if, if look if you're feeling the music then then why not i mean what people don't realize is you know anybody thinks like oh you know it's just they're following after their father lars's father is a like a well-known jazz yeah. musician in his you know in europe in his native country and in, in denmark and yeah it's like you know it's all out there man they just 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 go do it. And I, what I think is even more amazing, and I love, is that um, that isn't Overkill going to play like the parking lot show or Sun something? S Sunday. Yeah. They're playing Sunday. Prong is uh, Friday night. And the baby bands, it's, I like that term, yeah. they're playing both nights in the parking lot. And Ross Elfin's going to be there. Um, oh. Yeah, they build it as taking over the parking lot. And Walt and I, we, we've secured tickets for both shows. So we'll be down there and um, looking forward to it. I love that they, they throw it out there to guys like that still. And that like that show they did last year uh, for the Zazulas, they have Raven mm -hmm. open. You know what I mean? Like that's really remembering, you know, who helped you in the past or even who was running alongside you at, at the time, you know, in the past. I mean, obviously Metallica and their fame and success has far outstripped every, every other band almost every other band on the planet for that matter and oh sure but, sure I mean, there you know what i mean you don't see anybody doing something like that and and that's like that's like a really cool thing that i think that they're you know that they still have that and the fans still want to see it and i think it's great that overkill still out there and that that raven's still out there i think it's amazing they were terrific uh a couple about a month ago about we... a month ago promoting a new album scorched oh, yeah Tell the story. Tell the story, Walt. And uh, yeah, yeah, we were we were talking about the tour, and he announced like the tour, and I says, okay, well, you know, typically you hit the Starland Ballroom or somewhere in New Jersey. What's your date? And he kind of froze up, and all he did was this. He said, "Keep your eyes open for something special," okay. and that's exactly what it ended up being. So there's actually no New Jersey paid show on this leg of the tour, but it's the parking lot gig, which is which is even cooler. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's like whatever that is for them. It's like it's like you say the 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 spectacle of that and uh yeah. you know they they were they they're it's really just so cool to acknowledge uh some other old schoolers who really do go right back to yep. as early a days as metallica and still i'll say out there doing it and doing it strong you know on a on a new album release and everything it's just it's i think it's ter terrific and and blitz is really one of the one of the stand up guys that we all know in metal oh yeah, yeah. He's class. Adam, I'm just curious. I'm not sure, but has anybody ever done a documentary or a film on the old bridge metal militia from no, I, that scene? I don't believe, I don't believe so because I think metal Joe would have told me about it. Um, I think that's up your cat, up your uh, territory, buddy. It's, I know it's it, as, as I've done this stuff, people have, have, have pointed up there. Were, there were so many, so many, you know, scenes in other places and that's kind of why I'm, I'm, I was saying that just a few minutes ago about like, you know, really the, it needs more documenting. I can't yeah. do it all. I, can, I, can, I, I think all this stuff is great history and, and should be documented. And that's why I, in Murder in the Front Row, I, I went out of my way to include Old Bridge because I want to show, first of all, Old Bridge is not just about Metallica. That's probably their most famous interaction, but it's like, Got to remember the old bridge militia supported yeah. everything, you know, anthrax. When Slayer yeah. came to town, they put Slayer up, and Slayer, the first gig they ever played was in the the or the basement of the, those guys' house. So it's like, um, it was, it's really like, I, I think 
important that these other scenes are going on and by the way you know there's pieces of this in europe too yeah exactly too. exactly frank white and alan tecchio put a great ba- uh, book out back in uh, december uh, we had him on the show sure. called the history of uh, metal in new jersey and there's a lot of that toward yeah. archive footage and great photographs right from frank white's collection about that period of time you might want to check it out i will do it thank you i interviewed frank white and he he's a nice guy he's very cool yep so Adam, I uh, I'm self-serving, I have uh, my next project that I would like you to take on. Okay, this is the next project that I want to see the DVD on, and it'll be about the foods of the Lower East Side of New York City. Ah. So I know you've been to these three places as well yeah. as I have. So uh, <laughs> we just wanted to have a little fun as uh, we conclude the show, because these were, again, along with the rock pilgrimages, to the stores you had to eat and it was either yeah. wohops mamoons or grace papaya or all three in one day um could be um if your stomach could handle all three of those <laughs> uh i mean the hop was uh that was a fa- favorite you know when we were depending on how far downtown we were um that's that was definitely in the rick rubin uh catalog of places to go okay. and uh you know i mean grays are just all over and yeah we you know you'd hit those up but i remember going to to wool hop with uh with with rick um if we were certain a certain distance downtown there was there was uh you know there was a few others that were um there was a place on saint mark's no longer there now but was there then called dojos and it was right in the middle of the, the main block there and um we would go eat there a lot um the other place right around the corner from uh sort of on broadway around the corner from the dorm i mean by around the corner a couple of blocks but yeah. um there was a place called cozy supenberg which is still there and there the the deli is no longer there on the corner it's now like a fresh and company but in that space was a deli called deli on and all those places delivered and all that stuff the stuff that we ordered yeah. and uh ruben would order i mean man he was so far then <laughs> Man, it was just it was pizzas and all that stuff late at night. He didn't drink, so it wasn't wasn't beer or anything. But it was like it was like all that stuff late at night, late night Chinese food, late late night oh, um, deli on. But that's because we'd sit with Rick Manello at the front desk and like really discuss like film, like get our film education from him. So you know, like you're showing all these places, but these are places that we would like order from, eat at like two in the morning and you know and just yep. kind of talk just like what life was all about as young young dudes you know so um yeah i remember them fondly and well that would be a cool project well i would love to see it <laughs> and or as you were doing it having these uh zen master conversations you had to look down and make sure there was no mice coming across your teeth especially uh, over your feet especially at woho because that's just how it was back then but it was yeah. Um, yeah, I know. And, and it's like, you know, you would always, and even when I would come in from Long Island, I mean, those are the kind of places that you would like, I mean, you probably drove in as much as I did. And it's like, you know, you kind of, you go someplace, you got to eat something and then roll yeah. out. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, you know what? We're going to let you get back to your vacation because we've taken a, a little too much of your time, but um, you want to promote a- anything? Where can we, uh, people find out about your product? Um, I mean, uh, nothing to promote right now. Uh, just, just, you know, I mean, mer- I would just say this, if anybody is interested in what we've talked about here and they haven't seen murder in the front row and they're, and if you're at all interested in the history of thrash metal, then, you know, I, I just played the movie month. I hadn't screened it in a while, but I went out there, uh, and supported it and did a talk and, you know, there's still a lot of people that haven't seen it. And it's, you know, or people are just coming into this thrash community and want to know the history. And I just think it stands as as a uh, kind of, you know, a testament about that kind of music and what what it was at that time, you know. And and so it'll always be there for that, you know, to like welcome people into the community, just as the book will. And just as like when you create these podcasts, you know, they're, they're just yeah. going to be there. Well, you know, like yourself, we're always wa- working. And this came uh, into one of my inboxes today. And let me share this as we exit here. This is going back to uh, 1983. Here's Metallica in Rochester, New York. Uh, Cliff Burton and James Hetfield at the Riverboat opening for Raven. We got an yep. exclusive picture here. 
and there's the master Cliff Burton. Yeah. Just um, just you know, man. that's yeah. just just some fun stuff. But uh, Adam, uh, you, yeah. we're gonna uh, ask you just to stay on after we say goodbye. We have a question we want to ask you, and uh, we will see you in Jersey hopefully. And uh, thank you for your time, man. Rock on. Thank you. All right. Nice to talk to you, Adam. Maybe we'll see you at Wohops when John comes down. We'll drag him there at two in the morning. What do you think? No problem. (laughs) All right. I'll see you in the parking lot. That's for sure. Sounds good. Metal for Life. Thank you for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our website at MetalMayhemROC.com for information on podcasts, archives, links to all our live radio shows, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. And always remember to keep it heavy.